Our next keynote address is by Professor Sundaraman, and our chairperson for the session is Reverend Father John Thekakara, who is the Associate Director of St. John's Medical College Hospital, as well as the head of the Department of Hospital Administration. He himself is a passionate researcher in the field of hospital administration and health systems. He himself holds a PhD degree from the very prestigious Tata Institute of Social Science under the mentorship of Professor Sundaraman himself. Father John has various publications in both national and internationally famed journals. Father, may I now request you to kindly come to the dais and introduce our next eminent speaker. Very good afternoon, one and all present here. We pay our respect to Dr. Krupa. I'm happy to introduce Professor Dr. Sundaraman. As Ling has already mentioned, in, uh, my own mentor and guide. And that is the toughest task given to me this afternoon to introduce my mentor. I will not be able to do justice to that but I'll try to put a very brief picture of what he is. Dr. T. Sundaraman, the Thyagarajan Sundaraman, is a well-known expert in general medicine and retired from Chipmar Puducherry as the professor of medicine. I start from retirement because his most of the career and his passionate work starts post his retirement. He was then invited by the government to join as the director of State Health Resource Center, Chhattisgarh. He did a phenomenal job there by reaching out to every nook and corner of the state and making strategic interventions in the health sector of the state. His deeper understanding of the challenges of rural healthcare in India resulted in two major innovations. One is the Mithanin, which is now called Asha Workers, which is currently the major and critical health workforce of rural India and two, the rural medical practitioners, which is now taken by the union ministry for the whole of India. He was then elevated as the director of National Health System Resource Center, NHSRC in Delhi, which is the consultant organization for the union ministry of health and family welfare. His contributions to the formulation of the national health policy 2017 are unforgettable well uploaded concept of transforming the primary health centers from selective care to comprehensive care centers and reframing them as health and wellness centers. Originally is the brainchild of Dr. Sundaram. He worked tirelessly for the people of India to create more awareness among them that health is their right and not the mercy of the government. At times, he challenges the government, but often he works with the government, but he makes sure that he's always with the people. People's Health Movement and Regional and National Health Assemblies were the channels through which he did this mostly. Just a few days back, he stepped down from his role as the global coordinator of People's Health Movement. He was born and brought up in Tamil Nadu and is now paying back to the state by being the advisor to the Tamil Nadu health system. The health indicators of the state of Tamil Nadu will stand as proof for that. He is also an adjunct faculty of IIT Chennai in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences. Currently, he is also the chairman of the National Technical Advisory Committee for health technology assessment and hospital costing. Dr. T. Sundaraman is the author of several books on various topics like health technology assessment, public health informatics, and so on. He writes monographs of in-depth knowledge and hundreds of small booklets for the very common people to understand health and healthcare. 
Sir has led several projects as the principal investigator, which were funded by WHO and many other global agencies. To mention one such is the Global Adult Tobacco Survey. I was fortunate to be to the core investigator in a couple of small projects under him. Time does not permit me to read out the list of published articles he has in world-class journals, including The Lancet. They are more than 100 in number. Apart from all this, he's a very approachable person, simple and committed for the healthcare in India in all possible ways. He stands for his convictions and, and, for, and not for positions. He stands for public health and rural India and not for corporates. A political economist by ideology and a clinician by profession and a gifted researcher by birth. Happy to welcome Dr. T. Sundaraman, who is the most Sundar choice for this operation. Thank you, Father John, for this. Uh, invitation and for these very, very kind words. If the audience is left rather confused about who I am and what I have actually done, I don't uh, hold it against him. It is a rather confusing journey that I have had. And very often one uh, looks at one point of life where one can make the most difference and uh, leads you to different places in search of uh, trying to make a difference. I'm going to be speaking today uh, on a topic very close to my heart and which has a certain continuity. So the positions from which I approach this topic differ. The issue is of rights of people to health, of universalization of healthcare access. But from where I have worked on this differ. And I'm happy to note that I'm invited on the occasion of remembering an alumni of JIPMA and one of your outstanding uh, combinations of theoretical work and practical field intervention. That's something on Dr. Kirba Sankar that I pick up. And I'm very happy that I am on a stage where I will be speaking of and reflecting on the same theme. I would uh, take you on a quick journey through what primary health care is because many people may be new in this audience to some conceptual issues. Trace slightly the uh, experience, the why when the concept is so simple, there have been so many barriers to achieving this. Then take you through what has been done by many people. And uh, I have had a, a major contribution in this in the National Rural Health Mission and subsequently in the Ayushman Bharat experience with reference to primary health care. And then discuss with you a research agenda that I hope people here are inspired to take up and come to grips with. And all of this within hopefully the time available on this. Primary health care is an approach. It is an approach to the organization of healthcare services, which is defined by a set of features. I will be referring in this couple of slides on this to the WHO 2008 report on primary health care now. So almost a lot of quotes from there. To get a quick concept of it, the opposite of primary health care is not secondary and tertiary health care. It is hospital-centric care. If you talk of a hospital-centered approach or a primary care approach. Secondary and tertiary care and much of tertiary care is incorporated within the notion of a primary health care approach. That is one issue. So when we are talking of the essential features of primary health care, what are these features? 
I would list five features that are extremely important. One is comprehensiveness. And by comprehensiveness, we mean preventive, promotive, curative, palliative, rehabilitative, that set of comprehensive. By comprehensive, we mean non-communicable diseases, communicable diseases, uh, infections, reproductive and child health, mental health, that all illnesses, comprehensive in all illnesses. And by comprehensive, we mean in the levels of care, includes secondary and much of tertiary care, as one would put it. So we are talking of the primary health care approach. The approach is comprehensive. Second, it is population-based. It is about the health of the population. It is the health of, let us say, Bangalore City or Karnataka State or India or the people on the planet. It is about a population. It can be a war. It can be a thing, but it's about a population. What does that mean? It means that I am not only bothered and I'm just to bring that out as a hospital manager, if I am a St. John's hospital administrator or director, I am bothered that those people who walk into my door get the best quality care. I can't take responsibility for those people who never came to me. But a public health manager takes responsibility for those who did not come to him. Not only is he bothered about those who came to him, he should be even more bothered about people who ought to have come to him and did not come to him or on time. That is the notion of a population health-based health system. There are people who are excluded. There are people who are left out. There are people who have barriers to accessing care. That is also included in primary health care. Primary health care is inclusive. In that sense, it is population-based. And primary health care doesn't make sense if you are talking of primary care, the referral is implicit in it. You can say the a &M does antenatal care and uh, postnatal care and she gives uh, um, uh, uh, iron and folic acid tablets. But suppose a patient has hypertension. Suppose a pregnant woman has hypertension. If the care for hypertension is not available, the care for eclampsia is not available, what is the sense in our doing antenatal care? So her doing antenatal care has implied, her doing cancer cervix, has screening for cancer cervix has implied, her screening for hypertension has implied that there is this corresponding level of secondary and tertiary care available to resolve the population without which without ensuring the access to which this level of care by itself has no meaning on it. And that is why it's implicit in this. It is community-based and people-centered. And it has a performs a function of gatekeeping or gateways. These last two concepts, let me take two more slides to explain this. When we say people-centered and community-based, we are talking of a relationship between the provider and the people in the community served. In fact, one PhD doctor, I've got that in film. Remember to collect that film from me. There's a set of three films, 20-minute uh, films that we recently made that you can use. In Tamil Nadu, doctor said that, you know, in a public hospital, in a primary care center, if I am, I also do private practice, she said in the evening and I do public practice. But when I'm in a private practice, patient comes to me and leaves, I forget about them. When public hospital, he comes and leaves, I have to, I follow them up, I remember them, I have to go sometimes to the house, I have to see actually what is happening with that and I'm really bothered about it if they don't come back in time. So there is a whole nature of an enduring relationship. This in practice is not necessarily there, but at some point we are talking of a, what primary care conceptually replies. And it implies that it takes decisions based upon the social and personal context and ensures the continuity of care over a period of time across services. 
when we are talking of gateway of services it's not just referral and the whole purpose of this slide to is to reconceptualize referral as a important element of this and these are quotes from the 2008 report it effectively transforms the primary health care pyramid into a network where the relationships between primary care team and other institutions are not on a top down hierarchy or bottom up referral but on cooperation and coordination the primary care team becomes the mediator between the community and other levels of health system helping people navigate the maze of health services and mobilizing the support of other facilities by referring patients or calling the support of specialized services this is all the original quote from who on that so you must understand again this is a, a, a objective that has been difficult to realize now why has this been so difficult to realize broadly there is a confusion over the concept conceptually itself the confusion between primary level care and primary health care as an approach where you dump down primary health care approach to first level contact care or care for simple ailments symptomatic illnesses often self limiting or at best include rch in it is one major issue primary care is important there are techniques there are frontline workers but it is a subset of the overall level of care but this confusion has been very important for reason why you think that in a primary care oh, it's hypertension we can't do anything and at some point the exclusion the way the conceptualization had built up but a much more important reason in the indian context and in fact in the context of many low and middle income countries is policy driven so though you may have the bore committee report and the mudaliyar committee report chart out pictures in practice what happened especially from the late 50s early 60s right up to almost a date 79 1979 was that the whole of the primary health care system was captured if you may say so by the population control program and to some extent the malaria control program a little bit of other disease control national programs were there but largely population based program there was only one anm funded by the state and it was only given to that the male worker was on malaria the female worker was on population and somewhere the conception built around only these two but in the subsequent period 199 is onwards instead of this being something happening by default it became a high level policy when uh, under the world bank guided structural adjustment reform where there was a drive for privatization of services it became the recommendation that the government should restrict its provision of clinical services to a very narrow spectrum and leave the rest to the private sector so the privatization of primary health care did not happen by chance it happened by policy driven and what would be that small amount of services that would be given it was to be decided by an index called the dollar spent per tally saved a technocratic index which actually limited to if you look at it closely other than reproductive child health within that other than maternal and infant mortality it don't include abortion services or sexual health in a larger way what what it restricted to were those diseases which had a strong externality they could go back and affect the us if it was hiv or it was uh, uh, tb or it could affect the elite they were bothered about for something like covid 19 can strike the cities and therefore there is a great concern about that but on the other hand the package was very restrictive the result of this was that you had a loss of credibility and trust in the peripheral healthcare facilities you go for a snake bite they can't give care you go for an asthmatic attack they can't provide care you go for any other epileptic fit they can't provide care why would you go when your wife has got a bleeding uh, problem would you go there so they don't even go for the facilities services which are there because and in fact it can't do much on the bleeding also so in some sense the 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 facility the services it's Uh, provided are so designed and so dumbed down that they 
people bypass these facilities and go directly to the higher uh, offices which means that the public hospital at the higher level is overcrowded with primary care we did a study on kem hospital in mumbai and out of the 8000 to 10000 patients they see every day 6500 to 8000 patients are primary care patients equivalent they see to 100 primary health centers one hospital and you ask the look at the dermatology opd there is some 3000 patients can be standing there on a crowded day for dermatology because dermatology services are not available in any primary health center anywhere in urban nothing except for those who can afford it and who can locate a dermatologist and at some point there is a very few people who can actually afford for a skin rash or an itch afford to expend on it so in some sense there is a lack of services below i don't know and as a result the services at the higher level also survive but it also serves to uh, dismiss or denigrate the public health services and you you add user fees into it and therefore there are many problems that it leads to third of course are the infrastructure and structural constraints the number of facilities that were promised were never built the number of resources was largely into the tertiary care hospitals primary care failed to get the resources that it required and there were no and since 1990 there was no additional beds in fact in most of the northern states between 1993 and 2005 not a single nurse or doctor was recruited even to replace people who had died or retired because this was this whole theory of keeping government small and limited and to a little number of services especially at the primary care level on that this is the period when most of education got privatized most of it went commercial most of it went into the markets and at some point that was the period we had a whole sort of crisis on that so these crises and then there is a complete mismatch between what we create in the skills and what is required what is the sort of aspirations of those who enter our medical colleges nowadays it's much worse if you have to pay a few crores for your uh, post graduate seat with little chance you are going to ever think of public service and the changing culture of medical practice the whole technology driven center culture which makes it all of these were lead to also so there is a number of reasons why the simple instructions of primary health care did not take off to run against this tide thanks to a uh, a whole political change that occurred in the 2004 2005 period when an india shining campaign fell down it was replaced by a different understanding so primary health care re got its attention this is the time we formed the national health systems resource center um, was the person who was uh, asked to based on my chatisgarh experience to help guide this whole design of it so some of the key design elements of this was the focus on primary health care and the creation of the indian public health standard set down that a these a facility means a minimum set of standards in terms of infrastructure in terms of human resource in terms of consumables in terms of equipment and a certain set of services that is to be given just set it down i mean that was two steps forward one step back it was diluted later but still it's there the most recent iphs update has been released a couple of months back 2022 and there was along with it a promise that where the state is currently and where it ought to be by public health standards the nrhm will close the gap that was an important element of health system strengthening but it also said that there are many other reasons why public health systems don't work it's not only money and buildings and human resources and these factors would be addressed through architectural corrections the term was a new term and coined for the occasion because we didn't want to use health sector reforms health sector reforms had been associated with market based reforms of the 90s and these were explicitly non market based these were treating health as a public health good 
health care even for the poor as a public health good whereas those were really looking on market principles on supply and demand so this term architectural corrections was used and the key architectural corrections that we were talking about were decentralization the whole number of elements district health societies state health societies district level planning planning flexible financing communitization or a much greater role for community involvement so the ashas the village health and sanitation and nutrition committees the rogi kalyan samitis a lot of new acronyms were created professional management this is when the masters in public health courses really exploded across the country before you had only two centers running it now you have 50 to 60 centers running it you have a huge expansion in public health uh, public health management hospital administration a whole lot of courses started up yours must have also started around that time um, so it's uh, the whole uh, requirement for that started up innovations in human resource management health management information systems and quality of care accreditation the nhm did lead and this is the recent figure shows that it did lead financing did lead to substantial improvements in human resources and outputs if i were to talk of the positives there was a rapid decline a catching up with the global and surpassing the global average improvements in infant mortality rate maternal mortality rate and total fertility rates there was a huge increase in institution deliveries and many elements of pregnancy care and there was improvements in at least some of the major disease control programs tb wasn't one but polio hiv malaria some of these did much better within this particular time now on the other hand only these entire national concerns represented only 15% of the disease load all the national disease programs account for only 6% of the disease load and then you have pregnancy related care there was a growing burden of non communicable disease that it did not attend to a cost of care continued to rise public health expenditure fell far short of requirement so though they promised that money under upa 1 there was an increase with upa 2 the stagnation in budget and towards the last two years of the plan the first two years of the 12th five year plan actually it had stagnated so the promised level of infrastructure degrees did not decrease on that so this is the situation with which the next government comes to power and it adopts at some point a process of making the policy was there and the national health policy was there in 2014 the national health policy draft had been actually december 31st released it was finally approved in 2017 may be interesting to know what happened behind the doors on these two and a half years it was very much party to it so in some sense we were part of the drafting committee and one year after the drafting was uh, uh, completed i was appointed to the committee i mean uh, Uh, been called in to do the draft but uh, having said that at that time since we were associated with the earlier government we were not very much in favor with the new government on that but eventually they needed people who could help on this and they came back on this and did that but one of the important things on this was this new design that emerges this does not emerge in 2017 but subsequently we get to i mean immediately after but it emerges subsequently later and you see this the ayushman bharat with actually the primary care component is still part of national health mission but repackaged and renamed because as a political uh, entity it's important that the new political leadership has ownership over it if you work in health policy you will learn that doing this is important skill that you must provide that at some point it's important for the generation of political will it's not something that happens it's something that we have a responsibility to organize so it's not political will is there or not there no no you are working in this area you need to create the political will for it so and this whole notion of this so this whole the it had two components the health and welfare component which is part 1 and the pradhan mantri jan arogya yojana which is the insurance part of it the part 2 that component covered the secondary and tertiary care requirements and 
but much of it is still delivered through public health systems. And the other thing looked at the primary health care. Now, this health and wellness centers emerges from a task force which I chaired in the year 2015. It was a quite a high power task force. It had a number of very interesting, very competent people on that. And the main recommendation was the transformation of all the country's 146,000 sub centers and its PHCs into what are called health and wellness centers. Okay. And this was reiterated in the national health policy of 2017. And the health and wellness centers were characterized by a few essential features which are listed here. So in the process of transformation of a health and wellness center, first, the central thing is that the promised number of services there are the package of services is expanded greatly, which then needs to follow with or lead with human resource deployment. And then the amount of free drugs and medicines that are required. And then the community support for it and the referral support for it. So the transition from an existing sub-center to the desired health and wellness center is a transition that takes place uh, in a major way. And if you're proceeding towards universal health care, this is one of the ways in which it was envisaged under the national health policy, under the task force recommendations, under the Ayushman Bharat program. So if you look at the HWC timeline, the Health Wellness Center, it, implementation begins in July 2018, announced in the budget speech in February, but begins in 2018. Target is 150,000 centers by December 2022. By 31st March, 38,595 has been declared. By 2021, 74,947 have been declared. By March 22, they should have declared uh, 1 lakh and should have reached 1.5 lakh by December 2022. There's an interesting thing about this government. In some sense, it sits very rigidly to its targets because quite down the line, people are uh, held uh, accountable. Unfortunately, it doesn't mean that the content of what is expected to be there is solved. All these problems that we have inherited over 50 to 60 years, which are continuously present, which are at some point part of the way systems work, don't disappear overnight. So the declaration of sub-centers and PHCs as uh, uh, health and wellness centers should not lead us to any degree of uh, unnecessary comfort, much of the distance is still to be planned. The gaps are still very much there. I mean, therefore, talk about basically the several basic problematics that continue to pose challenges and where there is a call for researchers to come in as open questions that we need to actually research on. By this term problematic, I actually have a slightly different way. A problematic is a problem that exists in the past, will exist now, and will be there in the future also. Its answers are multiple and changes with the context, changes with the timeline, changes even with the ideology of the proponent. But these are sort of essential uh, issues around which a discourse is analyzed and around which movement takes place. So the seven that we have listed, it is how to get appropriate primary care team. What is a primary care team? How do we design the standard treatment guidelines? What can, how do you divide say ENT care between what happens at the uh, hospital? What can be done by a primary care worker? What is the left with that by that team? How do we get specialists and uh, primary care team to work as a team? As a non-trivial problem, specialists have their own angularities, so have primary care teams. And how do we build on the ASHA program while being fair to her without exploiting a caregiving worker? How do we make community active participants? What about information technologies? What about financing? And what about the social determinants of health? That's it.
there are more you can add more but i am talking of seven areas on which there is some research but a lot more is needed so the reason why i have gone into explaining this with this background is it's not that there is no research in the health systems and policy areas but most of it is descriptive and stating the obvious sometimes not even aware that many people have already addressed these problems and are now gone forward and that problematic now is at a different phase so you can't be giving the answers of how the problem was 10 years back this time i just as part of the policy moved around to uh, thing usually we used to say lack of specialists in tamil nadu in thing this time i was looking at district hospitals each district hospital had 90 specialists four psychiatrists 10 gynecologists uh, 10 orthopedicians what has happened something had happened in between all our post graduation uh, seat expansion of the earlier decade has started rolling out and uh, closing the gaps now so i can't be writing the same things i wrote in the policy 5 years back the problem is there the specialist problem is there but the problem has an entirely different character and therefore on the team the issue is should there be a mid level care provider is a doctor there how are ashas integrated into it what is the number of teams required the the situation on the ground gives you many natural experiments though it's a common guideline each state interprets it differently and does different things some people have trained nurses to become um, uh, mid level healthcare providers some have trained ayush doctors some have trained uh, paramedics of different sorts some have not done with mlhps some have posted medical officers in uh, phcs and there is enough scope for us to test given the different factors which one makes a better uh, choice then we have something that is much more important for the clinicians in rooms how does uh, you know one point is why does selective care still persists that's something that you have to understand but for each chronic illness what can be devolved to the team what can be addressed with telemedicine support everybody talks of telemedicine as if it will solve every problem telemedicine can solve what telemedicine can solve it can't actually do everything so but what is it that it can be solved and how do you know that it can solve it and how do you don't know where is the evidence that supports what is your privileged belief just because you are the head of, usually in government we decide by expert committee i am among experts somebody is super expert so what he says goes if if we expect that that we can't expect politicians to do differently as one politician told us on this that if you are going i used to be in contact with a lot of them on this so he said look if there is evidence to present it to me if it is opinion we'll go by mine i am the minister <laughs> you know at some point where is the evidence that we have behind many of all of these and that point is something we need to recognize so what functions required what point of care diagnostics to be introduced innovated so that you are actually able to do it at that level how do we standardize the drugs and then what are the diseases that are included in the package how does health technology assessment a whole new discipline a whole new science has emerged around these questions no longer are these questions answered by expert opinion they are answered by a methodology which is very interdisciplinary very challenging and i assure you very interesting i hope a few people make your careers in this because this is one area that's going to grow and how does one operationalize stgs across a complex disperse system so we have now a recommendation for pregnancy in hypertension on day 10 the cost effective analysis comes through and we change the recommendation how do we communicate this changed recommendation in one page of a guideline among 10 guidelines to 10000 doctors all over the country see that they have recognized it noted it and changed their practice accordingly how does one implement a standard treatment guideline even if one makes standard treatment guidelines there are international experiences to do that but we have absolutely no insight into it everything is a matter of oh, a sincerity or enforcement or political will no no actually the political will is much better there than the public health uh, uh, depth within many of these things then is the continuity of care problematic how do you get the team working 
what works they have tried help desk social workers the telemedicine work mobile vans or keep the uh, specialist let the facility stay in one place and move the specialist why is linkage with uh, uh, pmjay and the health and wellness centers proving so difficult they have been at it for some time now and they have not been able to achieve it now primary care can it be made a part can it be purchased pmjay is an insurance mode we have never been able to successfully put in primary care into the insurance mode and there are very many good reasons why it should not be done but is there been an option what has happened to the people who tried it and what are the types of conflict of interest the community as active participant is another major area where there is a whole lot of work i i've raised i'll draw your attention to two questions on this the asha we all agree now if you are asked to do a study and you come back saying the asha wants to be made permanent and the asha wants to be made uh, uh, given a better terms of thing that's well said but you don't need to be a researcher to say that that's about as obvious and as universally shared and known and every politician has said that long before researchers even raised the question but then why hasn't it happened and there are some reasons about financing but the finance is not of such a high degree but there are concerns that are there regarding accountability and community how does see the relationship between a factory worker and the motor car he provides is not the same relationship between a community health worker and the community health she provides one is alienated from the others but with the other thing one has solidarity how does one preserve solidarity and also accountability and also at some sense a regular terms of employment now you do it so because of being selected by the community how does that happen so when you look at and this question by the way is an international question i have dealt with it in international forums we have issues on this so many of these questions are just not local questions these are areas where we need to explore and why has for you know why has digitization been so difficult you know we always talk of digitization as if it's the solution what do you do sir introduce it we started saying that in 2002 it's 20 years now say different and there's this big paradox what i call i was telling him over lunch the techno optimism paradox the it fellows always say that you introduce it will solve every problem even problems that have no connection with it it guys are confident of solving yet they can't solve their own problem the what is their own problem they have poor impact nobody has shown that the introduction of it has improved outcomes nobody has shown that it has decreased the burden of uh, thing if uh, in computerization was introduced in banks and railway clerks and they had to do extra work you wouldn't have made it it has dramatically reduced the work in the bank and in the transport but it has dramatically increased the work of anms and peripheral care providers so this is one area where computerization has actually not been helpful to the peripheral area of that and there's little evaluation and learning so they are teaching everybody else with data but they themselves haven't learned from that so the simple functions of recording reporting enabling follow up computing population based data providing disaggregate data by uh cast and class and other disaggregators by risk groups etc this is a simple function we should have solved long ago but it defies solution and part of the reason is it's never been really looked through the lens of research it's all go 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 it marketing that does leads with the research rather than actually a laid back thing and also that at some point uh, it becomes tools of disease surveillance the worker is not working properly so i put a camera there then they'll work properly a very crude understanding of why people work or don't work on that so in some sense these are uninformed prejudices which actually we suffer from and which don't really lead to this how do we finance primary health care so how can you purchase some of these issues i have raised i'm going to skip through to address the social determinants of health you see there is this post called the municipal health officer which exists in small towns and big towns it was there in the british colonial times and those who had a law uh, public health act have continued it forward it's a well designed post 
but it needs to be modernized because today solid waste management is high technology. It's not solid waste management of an earlier thing. But what have we learned from what are the functions that currently social determinants do? How do you integrate it into primary health care? How do we look at areas of importance to the underlying determinants of health have a major role in primary health care in health outcome? So in fact, half the impact on a health outcome is not from clinical care. It is from the social determinants of health. So how have we, what has been done, what has been used to address it? Now, the declaration of health and wellness centers is most welcome. But unless we meaningfully address these problematics, we are not going to make much progress. And the problem is not the politicians, or at least not only the politicians, it is also a problem of the public health community, of the researcher community. Public health research systems need to go beyond stating the obvious. We are great at describing a thing and calling it research. In fact, very often it needs to document current understanding and practice, acknowledge that practitioners are also problem solving. And this is a very different thing from in other areas. You can't expect a doctor to come up with the treatment of COVID-19. And all the doctors who did come up with treatment of COVID-19 should be put in a suspect list. Okay. Uh, in some sense, the process of identifying what works for COVID-19 has an epistemology, has a certain methodology, cannot be abridged by saying, I treated 200 patients, all of them survived. I mean, come off it. But on the other hand, in public health, problem solving in health systems, problem solving by practitioners is very often the clue by which you look for alternatives. And that is something that is important to realize on that. So it's a positive science, like epidemiology is a hard science, but it is also a social science and methods from both have to be judiciously used. So policy decisions at every level have to be informed by evidence. But for that, it's not only, I mean, if I was talking in a political forum, I'll talk differently. I will definitely say it's the politician's problem. But when I'm talking in a public health community, in a researcher's community, I would like to say that, you know, point out that in this part of the community also there is a problem. It's not only on the political side of that. I close with this quotation, you know, that, Remember the research that happens over here. This is a famous quotation. Social science research will always be tentative and imperfect. It does not claim to transform the domain into an exact science. By patiently searching for factors and patterns and calmly analyzing the economic, social, and political mechanisms that might explain them, it can inform democratic debate and focus attention on the right questions. It can help us redefine the terms of the debate, unmask certain preconceived or fraudulent notions. Today, I have a Times of India article on the excess mortality issue. It's an important piece of uh, thing which we do. And subject all positions to constant critical scrutiny. That the nature of research in primary health care, in public health care, in implementation research is a different set of challenges. There's a different way in which epistemologically you look at it and how you pose it and how you move forward on it. It's a very challenging area. Health systems and policy research has become one of the leading domains of research now influencing everything. Health technology assessment is a subset of it. I hope you find this useful. Thank you.